last but not least, uh, John Prendergast uh, with the Enough Project. Thanks, Chairman McGovern and, and Congressman Duncan for, for showing up and for, you know, having this commission keep the spotlight on this issue with all of the other issues that we've got out there. I want to begin my testimony with a hypothetical question. What if all the efforts to bring Osama bin Laden to justice since 9-11 had been concentrated only on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border? What if the U.S. had had a reasonable idea of where he was, but instead had focused all of our operations over 100 miles away from Abbottabad? With that admonition in mind and recalling what my colleague Michael Poffenberger's comments were about access, I'd like to call the Commission's attention to this map and infographic we prepared at the Enough Project, the pink and green uh, map. As you can see, the, sh the shaded areas, the, the pink areas are the LRA zones of operation, as far as we can tell, throughout the four countries that the LRA has left after, uh, after leaving northern Uganda, at where they're operating and where they have access to or where they've been over the last two years. Uh, all told, those areas roughly equal the size of the state of Arizona. Now, Greg Pollack from the Defense Department said they were the state of California, so there's, it's somewhere in between those two. Then the hard line that's in this map is the area inside which the Ugandan Army operates and has access to right now. That area is about the size of West Virginia. The Ugandans are the only army at this juncture that are carrying out any kind of offensive operations and sustained operations against the LRA, and they have 900 troops. So that would be in Arizona or California with only a few paved roads and a thick forest cover, and of course the soldiers would have almost no air transport uh, and, and be poorly, poorly provisioned. And they're not even allowed into the Congo now as we heard from the last panel, and they're not allowed access into the far parts of northeastern Central Africa Republic, the top pink areas, which is where we think Kony is right now. Now, this, if this military operation is not significantly enhanced, then the mission is going to fail. Kony is going to continue to forcibly conscript, conscript kids with impunity, and repri reprisal attacks by the LRA will no doubt increase, thus actually further enhancing the vulnerability of civilians to attack in this area. In other words, all this effort, if not altered and improved, could actually make matters worse for the people of Central Africa if the mission isn't enhanced. Now, Congressman, this is a winnable war. So I wanted to give five specific things that I think if we step up to the plate now, not just the United States, but globally, because the Africans, of course, have put the troops on, on the front lines. The Europeans have, offered, have provided some assistance. We need to get everyone to, get, to provide a little bit more. These are the five things that I think the United States can do to improve the chances of a successful mission, to put us in the position to even have a chance of success here. First, we've got to deal with this access issue. We're not talking about the access issue that, that, that Assistant Administrator Earl Gast was talking about. He was talking about humanitarian access. That's a whole different can of worms we're talking about is the access for the Ugandan troops to actually get into those areas which are red zoned right now. We can't, of course, get into the areas of Darfur that the LRA has allegedly gone in and out of. The Central African Republic has actually told this, the uh, Ugandans they have to pull back from the northeastern parts of, of Central African Republic and they, can't get in, and, and they can't get into Congo. So there are lots of areas that are now red zoned uh, and, and the LRA can operate with total impunity. Now, the U.S. is the only country in the world outside of the region that actually has put boots on the ground, and for that they have to be greatly commended. That gives us some credibility in the region and around the world because we're putting, it, putting our, 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 our uh, personnel on the line. And so we've got to utilize, I think, higher-level diplomacy to go at Kabila and some of the other uh, leaders in the region to ensure that access to troops for troops that are actually searching for Kony and the leadership of the LRA can have that access. Second, I think better intelligence is needed and, and, and needs to be shared. I wanted to give one illustration. There were some recent LRA attacks in, in the Garamba National Forest, which National Park, which is down there, the, the, the lowest, the southeastern most green area on the map. Um, my colleague who works in the region 
uh, was in visiting with, this, with a senior United Nations official. The UN official said he had no idea if it was the LRA, if maybe it was the FDLR, maybe it was even South Sudan troops that had committed these attacks. Now, if that level of, of uh, personnel in the international system has no idea who is doing what to whom, we've got a serious problem. We need to deploy the right amount of ground and air assets to figure out who's who and where they are. Now, the best case scenario off the books is that if the intelligence that's currently being collected, and we saw this incredible you know, uh, investigative research done by the Washington Post the last few days, uh, if that intelligence uh, is going to be put to use uh, uh, in, in some specific mission for which all the appropriate assets are going to be put into place, fantastic. We don't have that information, but if that's the case, it short circuits all of this stuff. But in the meantime, what we got is all these you, uh, uh, African troops on the ground and this effort, and we've got to have the intel to, to support them. Third, I think we have a troop problem. Uh, the 900 forces for the, an area the size of Arizona or California isn't going to cut it for the search and seizure for Coney and the top leaders. Neither is, do we have sufficient support to protect civilians in this much bigger area than the Uni Ugandan People's Defense Force has access to. So we need more of a contribution from the regional governments to civilian protection and then the, the pr appropriate support provision for those, for those folks to protect civilians. And then we need, to, we need more special forces to, com to conduct the kind of commando operations that will be the only ones, unless there's this secret mission being planned, that will be the only ones to, that will be able to, to, to undertake the uh, kind of, a, uh, of, a, of an attack that's necessary to be able to, to capture uh, Kony and the other leaders. Fourth. Once the LRA leaders' whereabouts are established and the right troops can, can be deployed, let's say we have the right troops and they're ready to go, it all becomes moot if there is inadequate transport to the targeted areas. And Michael uh, uh, covered that in his testimony in the sense that we've got to get that money spent quickly so that helicopter support to, can move the tra can transport the, the uh, African troops to the, to the zones when there's a hot lead if we actually know where Kony or one of the other leaders are. Fifth and finally, non-military aspect of a successful campaign are, are equally important, as, as Sister Angelique just spoke about. Uh, we need a more effective uh, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration program. We know we've done these kind of things all over the world. There's no money left. If, 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 there's no way to entice LRA in the bush to actually come out right now. So that's a really important uh, uh, additional element that needs to be put into place. In conclusion, the bin Laden mission was ultimately successful because the right assets were collected and aimed at the right location, the right target. The international geopolitical environment and investment is understandably much lower for the Kony mission. But for millions of families on the front lines of the LRA's depredations, the stakes are just as urgent. And for U.S. troops that have been deployed out there with bipartisan support, we have simply not yet given them the means to succeed. I'd like to conclude with a thought about political will, and it builds on your opening comment, Congressman McGovern. Usually there's really little to no constituency support for any kind of effort abroad that appears not to be in our core national security interest. But as you pointed out, this is different. There is a constituency of primarily young people all throughout the United States that wants this Congress and this President to do what it takes to end this. And in a contentious and distracting political season, what an incredible gift a successful anti-LRA mission would be, would make for young first-time voters, just as you said, whose belief in our ability to do good in the world would be validated. And what much bigger gift, too, to families all over Central Africa who would no longer have to worry about their children being kidnapped by a group that should have been eliminated a long time ago. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much uh, for your testimony. I, I appreciate it very much. And Mr. Poffenberger and Mr. Prendergast, if I were to kind of summarize your testimonies, it's kind of like a kick in the pants to the administration that they, they need to step it up. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it, and it is a little bit frustrating to know that, uh, you know, some of the issues are, are not about what they're authorized to do or what there is money to do. I mean, it's whether or not they haven't used, the, they haven't used their authorization. They haven't used, spent all the money uh, that they've, that, that, that's available to them right now. Um, and so... Um, you know, I mean, one of the things that we need to maybe figure out here as a, as a commission is how maybe working with all of you, we can kind of um, come up with a list of specifics that they can do right now. I mean, without Congress having to act and pass anything else, I mean, there are things they could do right now. But I guess my question for both of you is how do we get all the governments in the region 
to allow military operations in their territory. I mean, I understand the issues of sovereignty and people getting nervous and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, I, I guess the way how do we how do we resolve that? How do we get everybody together? Uh, reading up the same sheet of music here. Yeah, I can add a couple of thoughts. I'm sure um, John will have more to say. Um, the benefit with the situation of the LRA, with the possible exception of the government of Khartoum, is that historically and at present, they don't have friends in the region, and nobody stands to gain anything significant by allowing them to continue these kinds of atrocities. Um, I think that you know the administration demonstrated uh, real hands-on leadership and how they've managed things internally to get that advisor operation out the door uh, and to keep following this issue closely, but they haven't shown that kind of leadership uh, within the region itself. Um, I, I don't think it would have to take all that much to do so. Um, um, we've been calling very specifically for the President and the Secretary of State to be engaging directly with regional heads of state. Uh, we have no indication that they have yet done so. Uh, or even to convene a meeting at the upcoming UN General Assembly with those heads of state and show that the U.S. is serious about this problem set and that it means a lot to us uh, that they collaborate uh, uh, to address it. And I think that would make an, an enormous difference. The only footnote to that uh, excellent beginning is, is that I think we can do it unilaterally and we can do it multilaterally. And I think going to France and to China, particularly, and going to the uh, United Nations Secretary General and the African Union, the key countries within the African Union, and making joint representations to the uh, governments, to the heads of state in CAR and Congo and Sudan to allow that access, I think that increases the odds dramatically over simply a unilateral effort, one-time effort from a call from one of our leading officials in our government. So I think doing the two-track, the, the unilateral and the multilateral, gives us the best chance of success. Before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge that Congressman Frank Wolf from Virginia is here. I don't know, Frank, whether you want to add any – any no. One, thank you for having the hearing. We just got out of a markup on probes. And thank all the witnesses. All my staff's been here. They'll, they'll tell me uh, what you said. But I want to appreciate it, and I want to thank you again, Jim, for, for having the hearing. Do so you have – you want to – yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I <coughs> – I, um, I'm interested in the radios that you mentioned earlier, and I, I watched some of the videos that are online, the YouTube, setting up the radios. And one thing that struck me when I was watching that is, um, is how the LRA would react going into a village where these radio towers, you know, they're, they're constructing these things high enough to get uh, a signal. And so is that not a beacon for um, attacks, as it had been? And, that's just something that struck me when I first saw that. Well, I would say that the communities themselves are aware of, of that risk. Um, there's, to my knowledge, only one case of somebody who operated one of the HF radios having been attacked, and we don't know whether they were attacked because they were an HF radio or they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and certainly there is the risk that the LRA could retaliate against communities that are sharing information about their activities. I want to defer that question actually to Father Benoit, um, who runs the, the early warning radio network in northeastern Congo um, uh, and can provide a, a much better answer to that problem. Um, I would say too, though, that, that the benefits that these radios can bring are, are enormous. It's a, it's a very low-tech, low-cost intervention that equips these uh, communities with information that is life-saving at times. Um, there was an attack in December of 2009, just to illustrate uh, the remoteness of the region that we're talking about, where the LRA went village to village over four days uh, and killed over 350 people. And uh, if those vi villages at that time had been outfitted with this kind of simple technology, they could have provided uh, early warning to each other. But more than that, they could have informed security forces in the region that this was what was happening. And instead, it took more than three months for news of that attack of 350 people being massacred to reach any kind of outside audiences or be confirmed in any way through a Human Rights Watch report. Uh, and that's the kind of challenges that we're up against. And I want to I turn that question to Father Kinalegu. Okay. Um, you, you, okay. You, you Merci beaucoup. Uh, le radio ACF entre dans le cadre du projet Alerte Précoce et c'est moi qui suis l'initiateur de ce projet. Uh, the radio uh, FM enter in uh, the order of the project uh, early uh, intervention, which is which I am the uh, the initiator. 
C'est un système de communication qui existait déjà à l'époque chez les missionnaires qui étaient venus chez nous. This is the kind of the technology that existed before uh, within the uh, missionary uh, uh, in the missionary uh, uh, services that je have been in my country in the uh, in the past. J'ai essayé de recadrer ce système là dans le cadre de la conf de conflit actuel de la LRA parce que la commune il y avait beaucoup de communautés qui étaient séparées isolées les unes des autres. I I I I would like to 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 reshape this project in the uh, in the area based on the fact that so many uh, population and family have been dispersed. Et que après chaque attaque, on apprenait de ces attaques-là après cinq jours, après une semaine, deux semaines parfois. Because uh, we usually heard about the attack after uh, several days, uh, two weeks or, or three. L'idée est venue d'installer les fournis un peu dans chaque communauté, dans chaque village, pour nous permettre d'être au courant de ce qui se passe dans la région. The, uh, the original idea was to install this uh, uh, antenna in all the, uh, the area, the, uh, the village, in order to share the information about the attack that's going on in the area. Et les villages voisins peuvent prendre des précautions lors des attaques d'un autre village pour pouvoir se protéger. Which will allow the neighbor village to be prepared when an attack happens in, uh, in the, the village next to Quant à nous, nous, cela nous permet d'alerter les opinions nationales et internationales. And for we, that allow us in order to alert the uh, local and international community. C'est comme ça que nous avons élaboré ce projet et avec l'appui et l'aide des, des États-Unis à travers nos partenaires euh, des organisations de droits humains, nous avons installé cela et aujourd'hui. Nous, nous pouvons dire que nous avons beaucoup d'informations chaque jour et sur toute la région. And that's why we have put this project in place with the assistance of uh, our partner, uh, our partner with and also our partner uh, of the human right. And today, I can tell you today that if an incident happened, the information uh, is dispersed very, very quickly and efficiently. Aujourd'hui, un incident peut se créer dans un petit village de la région et que ça peut atteindre facilement les États-Unis. Today, if an incident happens in a very remote village, this information can come to the United States the same day. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Um, Mr. Prendergrass, um, you mentioned that... Um, the United States is the only country that has boots on the ground. And it raised outside of the African region, yes. And it raised a question with me, why? Why haven't any other countries this is a global um awareness campaign that's that's gone on on the internet. It's been amazing. Um I was in a Sonic drive through the other day and there was a Coney sticker on something. I'm like in, in a very rural town in South Carolina. This is a global awareness campaign that and so I asked the question. Why aren't any other countries stepping up? I think it's a, it's a geopolitical issue, and that is that we've, we've had two just brutal wars, international wars, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last decade. And I think that the amount of treasure and, and personnel that uh, nations around the world have committed to those things has made, have, and the political issues that all of them are facing, most of the troop contributing countries have very severe, serious economic problems right now internally. Uh, it's very difficult to even contemplate the idea of sending. It was an incredibly uh, 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 courageous, I think, uh, uh, move for the president to send even 100 advisors to Africa. And he only could do it because there's total bipartisan support for the effort to try to bring Joseph, uh, the LRA to an end. Uh, and, and, and the Congress, because of your efforts, so much of Congress's efforts has, uh, over the last decade has solidified that. There isn't that kind of a popular constituency in some of these other countries. We can make the representations and ask for specific uh, support if, if for an enhanced mission, uh, if we're willing to do that. 
taking sort of the diplomatic efforts a step upward. And that's why Michael slipped it in there. And I think we want to highlight what he said. We've been, we're calling on the administration to uh, ask or to call for a meeting in the United Nations General Assembly meeting in September of all nation states, just like Obama, President Obama did in 2010 for the South Sudan issue. And it was very catalytic in getting everyone, and particularly these Chinese, focused on the need for the referendum in South Sudan to occur on time and, and peacefully. And I think the same kind of effort could be expended to get other nations to participate in this kind of an effort. Uh, <clears throat> you just for a second? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, just going, building on his question, it, it